Okay, we are all set. Uh, over to you, Akshay. The virtual stage is all yours now. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, Analytics Vidya for organizing um, Data Hour series. It's really a good platform um, to uh, upskill um, various people on the technical um, data hour uh, processes and the different technologies. So today we are going to deep, have a deep dive over um, Apache Spark. So we will try to aim to understand what the Apache Spark is. At the same time, we will also see how uh, Apache Spark is uh, using uh, parallel computing and uh, distributed computing applications for the optimal and uh, processing of data. So I would like to share my screen now. Uh, just give me a couple of moments. I hope you are able to see my screen. So let's kick off. So in this session, we will focus on introduction to big data processing using Apache Spark. And uh, that's a brief slide about me. Um, so I have around 10 years of experience in data engineering. And in the past, I've worked in the various domains of finance, uh, automobile, telecom, internet, and retail. So I did uh, my graduation in computer science and engineering. And uh, after that, I had an MBA uh, from IIT Delhi and currently working uh, as current working as a research scholar at AM Lucknow. So I did author uh, some research papers in the past in some of the journals on uh, data processing and natural language processing. And uh, I also contributed towards a technical review of some of the books. Speaking in terms of core, core interests for me, uh, data engineering is one of uh, the area where I'm very passionate about. And apart from that, I love to read and prefer to travel to explore different cultures. So that's a very brief uh, background about me. Okay, so let's dive into what's the agenda for today's uh, session. So we will uh, have a conversation about uh, evolution of data pipeline, how the data has evolved across the different uh, years in the past, and uh, how the Spark has played its role in the journey of the data pipelines um, processes. Then we will have a brief introduction to Apache Spark. We will be focused upon how, what the Apache Spark is and how the Apache Spark has evolved uh, across the different years in the past. After that, we will briefly touch upon the Spark uh, ecosystem, how the Apache Spark uh, ecosystem works, what are the different components of the Apache Spark ecosystem are, and what are the offerings which Apache Spark ecosystem provides for us. After that, we will deep dive on the distributing processing in a Spark, where we will focus on uh, understanding uh, how the actual uh, distributed processing happens across the different parts of the nodes within the cluster. And then we'll focus more on the logical and the physical processing uh, executions uh, and the optimizations of codes that happens uh, behind the screens in the Spark. We will also focus on a few bits on the Spark terminologies, which you may come across uh, very frequently. So for example, what the Spark jobs are, or what, how the jobs are broken down into stages, and what the tasks are, and some of the nitty goodies uh, about the various uh, terminologies, for example, um, transformations, actions, RDDs, data sets. So we will just try to focus and clear up some doubts over those uh, terminologies. Then we'll also focus on some of the Spark performance tuning in, uh, tips, uh, where we, how can we improve our, the Spark executions? And also we'll try to understand how can we gain a more efficient Spark computations by uh, applying during the cluster. And then we will have some kind of uh, exercise using the Google Colab. And in the end, we will have, uh, maybe if the time permits, then we might take questions. Um, uh, so you feel free to put your questions in the chat chat box and then we will take it up from there cool so setting up an agenda then let's kick off um today to the session so let me just move it sideways okay cool so evolution of data pipelines why it's important uh to understand the evolution of data pipeline across different uh, years uh, in the past the reason is uh, that's how uh it has shaped the current state of the Apache Spark, as well as other different technologies that are available for the data processing in the current era. So if we uh, please, if we go back to the year 2004, 
Uh, then Chef and Sanjay uh, came up with the concept of map reduced processings, which allowed us to not or, uh, only process the data at the scale, but also lays the foundation of uh, MPP systems, or if we talk in terms of uh, efficient processing and computations, then it allowed us to you know, break down all the computation across the different worker nodes and then aggregate the results uh, up to the driver nodes. But the challenge uh, in this map reduce concept was that every time you are breaking down and aggregating the intermediate results, the aggregated uh, results in the intermediate steps are being written to the storage systems, which cause a, an inefficient IO computations and IO computations are always expensive to process the and cause becomes a bottleneck in the data processing. But nonetheless, it provided a very good uh, foundation in the framework. How can we distribute uh, the jobs across the different nodes and how can we just go and implement the horizontal scaling of, for the data processing. After that, uh, in the year 2006, when uh, Doug came up with um, the concept of Hadoop ecosystem, uh, in the Hadoop ecosystem, he practically used uh, MapReduce as an underlying data processing framework, but at the same time, he also introduced some of the other components of the Hadoop ecosystems. So for example, if you can imagine if you're working on with a Hadoop cluster, then you will need a cluster manager. You will need, also need a file system where you will be actually processing and storing your data. So he introduced Apache Yarn um, and Hadoop uh, as a cluster manager. And then you have a very famous HDFS uh, components, which came up uh, during this uh, Hadoop ecosystem implementation. But still at this particular point, uh, implementing MapReduce uh, concepts and writing the custom Java codes is a bottleneck and is very cumbersome for the developers uh, who are involved in big data processing. So in 2007, Chris came up with a cascading um, as a abstraction layer, which did perform some of the simplifications of writing the MapReduce job, but it was still um, not that but easy to write up map reduce jobs and then performs the uh, parallel processing across uh, the different components into the system. Then in 2008, to simplify the data processing, uh, we had an Apache PIG that was um, introduced, which uh, it's a high level platform for building Hadoop jobs and writing out your batch jobs and processing the data in the batch format. But uh, still, it was cumbersome at uh, to write the map reduced components uh, within the Hadoop uh, ecosystem. So until this time, you can see the trend uh, that we also wanted to process the data at a scale in a very efficient manner, but at the same time, we also wanted to simplify how we process the data. So the focus was not only on the efficient uh, data processing, but also simplifying the data processing operations. We had different um, technologies that were being introduced at this point, and also the volume of data was growing. So the emphasis on both the data processing efficiencies as well as the simplification of, of data processing. Uh, in 2011, when we had uh, the use cases of streaming data or the near real-time data processing, then Kafka came into the picture, uh, and it was introduced by Jay while working at LinkedIn. And in the same year, Nathan also came up with Apache Storm which provided and distributed real-time computation engine for processing data streams. So up to uh, 2011, you can see we had um, certain uh, technologies to process the data in the batch format. At the same time, we also had some technologies to process um, the data uh, in the which is in the form of real-time streaming streams. So in 2014, at uh, this particular point, uh, Spark 1.0.0 was released and which provided a uh, Spark SQL as an abstraction layer on top of uh, Spark. So while this um, uh, development was uh, very significant in 2014, because SQL is the primary language that was used by lots of developers. And when we had an Spark SQL that was available, then it becomes very easy to interact and write the customized uh, your Spark queries to process the data without uh, going into the writing the custom jobs. In 2016, uh, in the same journey, we had an Apache Flink that was introduced and Apache Flink uh, focused on having um, kind of a Lambda architecture 
so that we can process not only the stream data, but also we can process the batch data. So you can see the trend is basically um, simplification as well as uh, catering to different needs of the big data processing, the streaming data, as well as, as um, the focus on batch data processing at, at the same time. Then in 2017, we had an Apache Beam that was introduced and it basically uses the sum components uh, on uh, for Flink, but at the same time, we had an ETL capabilities that were also available in Apache Beam. So you can see across this uh, timeline, uh, we were trying to not only optimize the processing of data, but also we were focusing on simplifying uh, the data processing uh, across this journey. So having set this um, uh, kind of a stage for the introduction of Apache Spark, let's try to understand what the Apache Spark is and why it's important and what are the different components uh, that are available in Apache Spark. So uh, Apache Spark, let's try to understand what the Apache Spark is. Apache Spark is a multi-language engine. So when I say multi-language, uh, it supports both uh, both the multiple languages, for example, Python, R, Scala, Java. So it provides an abstraction uh, or kind of uh, APIs to interact with the engine in the language uh, that you would prefer to write your code uh, or interact. So it's, it's a multi-language engine for executing data engineering. So when I say data engineering, we are uh, aiming to process multiple uh, types of data. We want to process batch data. We want to process the streaming data. We would like to process um, unstructured data coming in the form of JSON uh, or JSON files. So there is a huge varieties of data that we would like to process. We might like want to process graph-based data where the data is stored in the form of nodes and edges. And in the data science areas and machine learning areas, we may want to perform lots of different type of uh, prediction algorithms. We may want to come up with some kind of uh, uh, predictions for the loan applications using logistic regressions, or we may want to go with the sophisticated uh, algorithms of XGBoost or Adaboost. Uh, it could be anything. So what does Apache Spark did? It provided a multi-language uh, unified engine so that irrespective of uh, the language in which you are comfortable with, you can use Apache Spark for a variety of use cases of data engineering, data science on a single loan machine or on the cluster. So it's important to understand on a single load machine or on clusters. So you could either use a single machine in which your uh, master node and the slave node will reside within the same machine, or you can use a clusters containing thousands of machines, which can be acting as a worker node or one of the machine from this cluster can act as a master node. So it's important to understand uh, here uh, what the Apache Spark provided and so we can see Apache Spark provided the language choices, um, pro data processing choices, different use cases. And the latest version of the Apache Spark that is available at this point is 3.2.3, uh, which was released a couple of months ago. And then the first version was released um, 10 years ago, uh, which was Apache Spark um, 0.6.0. Now let's try to uh, understand its timeline as well. So we can see here that we had a map reduced paper in 2004, which was um, uh, came into an existing by uh, Jeff and Sanjay. And after that, the actual Spark uh, paper, which was came into 2010 by Zaharia. Then in this um, Spark paper, it was conceptualized that what if we don't write the intermediate research into the uh, persistent storage and thereby reducing the IO operations and keep the intermediate results within the uh, memory to allow the in-memory computing for the efficient and the faster sure. applications uh, processing. And, and then in 2010, the Apache Spark was open source. And in 12, we had an RDD paper that came into an existence by Zaharia. In RDD paper, uh, it was conceptualized that we, we will have a resilient distributed data sets or our data will be partitioned and distributed across the different nodes which should be resilient so that we can compute uh, if they are lost because we are working within the memory or the RAM. So data might get lost. It's important to maintain its lineage. Uh, at the same time, uh, during the next year, we had an Spark streaming paper came into the picture by uh, Zaharia. And then 
you can see pretty much the timeline is same and we have the Kafka uh, that was introduced in 2011. So as the data types were changing, use cases were changing, uh, and the research on the Spark uh, framework was also progressing. And then in 2014, it became Apache's top level project. And after that, we can see that for each year, there were lots of different um, uh, application availability uh, uh, processing capabilities that were being introduced. So for example, next year we had uh, a Spark SQL paper, and then we had a uh, graphics uh, paper that came into the existence uh, to support graphics libraries. And then we had a uh, TensorFlow paper, which was raised to, uh, which came into existence in 2016 for the uh, deep learning use cases. And then we had uh, the deep learning pipelines, which came into existence in 2017 to support um, TensorFlow or Horoword um, libraries of the deep learning use applications. So after that, uh, let's move uh, to understand uh, the different aspects of Apache Spark ecosystem or what the Apache Spark ecosystem consists of. So you can see in, pretty much in the Apache Spark ecosystem, we are focusing on the different aspects of the data processing, as well as the management of cluster. So starting with the uh, programming uh, layer of the Apache Spark ecosystem, you can see uh, it's a single um, unified interface and provides a choice of different uh, languages for the development of your Spark jobs. You can write your code in Java, Scala, Python, R, in any of the language you are comfortable with. And it provided libraries for the different use cases. So if you want to interact with um, uh, Spark using SQL, you just go ahead and explore using Apache uh, Spark SQL uh, library. And then if you're working on the graph um, based systems, creating nodes and edges, we have a graphics library available in the Apache Spark. Uh, for streaming use cases, Apache streaming, uh, Spark streaming uh, is available and for data science applications, we have MLAB libraries that can be used for uh, building our data science models. Uh, speaking in terms of engine, so Apache uh, Spark core is the core engine which is common irrespective of the type of libraries you are using or the programming language you are using. Your core engine will remain same. It uh, won't vary. Uh, it doesn't depend on the library or programming. So underlying institutions happens within the JVM environment, which remains same. And in order to manage your cluster, so if you are working in a cluster mode, you are free to use any of the cluster manager. So for example, you can go with the Hadoop yarn to manage your cluster, or if you are working on a standalone mode, you can actually focus on uh, a Spark uh, a standalone cluster as well. Uh, speaking in terms of uh, storage, because it's important to uh, understand at this particular point that Spark is a processing engine. It doesn't contain a persistent storage for uh, storing the data. So you need to have some source as well as sync where from where you are going to read the data and you will uh, store your processed data. Uh, and Spark allows us to have an interaction or with multiple sources and syncs. So you, your uh, data source could be a traditional uh, CSV or a TXT file, or you might be reading data and writing data to Hadoop HDFS layers, or you might also interact with uh, data storage layers uh, available in cloud. So for example, Amazon S3 or Azure Blob Storage, or it could be a NoSQL database as well. Uh, for example, you might be reading data from MongoDB. So here you can see in this uh, ecosystem, there is a lot of flexibility uh, available at each layer and depending upon the use case, upon the sources and the sync that you are using and comfortable. So after understanding the Apache Spark uh, ecosystem offerings, let's uh, try to deep down a little bit more on the distributed processing in a Spark, how this, this distributed processing in a Spark happens. So all the uh, applications, whenever there is any request uh, goes for the data processing, it always goes to the driver node or the master node uh, to the system. So master node is the main method, uh, is the main uh, node, which consists of the main method, which actually performs, uh, which starts an execution uh, for this. So you can see within the master node, we have a driver, 
which consists of Spark Context uh, as a first uh, program, which you can think in terms of it's a main program which uh, gets executed whenever you interact and send your uh, query to the driver node. And this uh, Spark Context or the Spark session provides a gateway for the further communication with the cluster manager. Um, why I mentioned cluster uh, Spark Context or session uh, Spark session, because before Spark 2.4, uh, we had uh, Spark Context available for the uh, as a first session, as a, another session um, gateway to manage to have a communication with cluster manager if you are using a core native APIs. And if you're using a Spark SQL, you will have the SQL context. So there were different um, Spark, con uh, Spark context or SQL context available or the functions available for the different use cases. So in order to simplify that uh, after Spark uh, 2.4.0, uh, uh, Spark provided a single uh, Spark session. Now you don't have to create your own context uh, for each different use case. You can just uh, go and kick off your Spark session uh, within the driver program to interact, uh, whether you are using um, Spark SQL or you are using PySpark or Spark R, so irrespective of the type of context, it's the Spark session provides a single gateway for the further communication with the cluster. Uh, so all the communication that happens um, within the driver uh, node, then it actually demands for the resources uh, from the cluster manager. So if you are, let's say, reading the data, you or you want to process the data, so it needs to get some kind of a worker nodes or an executors to process the data. So it interacts with uh, cluster manager using your Spark sessions and asks uh, how many workers can I get? Can I is it possible to get these many workers? And then the cluster manager manages your uh, resources and it has this information of of how many worker nodes are up and running. And it provides this information back to the driver node and allocates those worker nodes to the driver nodes. Within the worker nodes, um, we have the set of processes which are performing the actual computation and the data processing. And these processes are termed as executors. And within these executors, uh, the data is uh, divided into smaller, smaller chunks. And this processing and the computation is also divided in, at the lowest scale. Uh, which is known as task. So within the worker nodes, we have the set of executors and each executor will be performing a certain task in parallel. So if in order to summarize uh, the entire processing uh, until now, so we had a driver node which receives a request for data processing from the client applications. It requests for resources using cluster manager and cluster manager allocates these worker nodes to the driver node for the data processing and provides the information of uh, or how many executors are available and what are the different um, uh, memories that levels that are available. And then the driver node allocates the work to these uh, worker nodes. Worker nodes performs the computations or the data processing in parallel and then sends these results back to the driver node uh, as uh, the physical and the logical uh, plan that was created by a driver node. So we'll deep dive more into um, this architecture, and I will just revisit this uh, in the subsequent slides as well. So how this uh, physical and the logical processing happens within the Spark environment. So you have a user code here in the left um, right corner, and then uh, this user code, when it goes to the driver node, it's uh, completely unresolved up to that particular point. And uh, what the driver node does, the driver node needs to first validate whether your uh, unresolved logical plan is valid or not. So for example, you might be reading a file from a location which um, doesn't exist, or you might not have an access to read the data or process the data. Then it checks that particular metadata information from its catalog. And then after its analysis, and if it's valid, then it goes into the creation of resolved logical plan or how the data is going to be read. Once uh, the resolved logical plan has been created, then it goes to the logical optimization uh, to create our optimized logical plan. And this particular point, it's very important to understand how this logical optimization happens because this is the core of uh, data processing in a Spark. So a Spark internally uses tungsten and catalyst optimizer. So what the catalyst optimizer does, it tries to uh, apply the 
code optimization strategies, for example, constant folding or removing um, the parts of code which are not being touched on. So various um, code optimization strategies are embedded into the catalyst optimizer, which tries to optimize this uh, resolve logical plan. And what the tungsten optimizer does, it tries to come up with the memory management techniques. So for example, uh, how many, uh, how the garbage collection is going to happen, how many, um, how the memory management is going to happen, what is a heap space that is going to be available. So all the memory management um, optimization happens through the tungsten optimizer, whereas the code optimization this goes through the catalyst optimizer. Now, up to this particular point, you can see we had an optimized logical plan here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So we had an uh, optimized logical plan that has been created until now. Uh, but there could be multiple uh, physical plans that may be available after this uh, from this uh, optimized logical plan. So what the Spark does, it creates the multiple physical plans of the query execution. And then within these multiple physical plans, it uh, calculates the cost of each particular plan um, for the data processing. And then a cost model decides which physical plan is the final plan to go with. And then we have the best physical plan that has been identified. And then using this best physical plan, driver nodes uh, decides the data processing steps uh, to be executed on the cluster. So you can see like here that it in the entire execution of the Apache Spark processing, we had um, certain optimizers that are available. And this is um, the beauty of using Apache Spark and the constant work is being done to improve uh, the optimization process of uh, creating different optimizers. So in the project Hydrogen, uh, we are current, uh, Apache Spark is currently working on um, supporting deep learning uh, various use cases because we also want to have a good communication across different um, um, driver uh, across the worker nodes uh, in the deep learning use cases. The reason is, so for example, if you are training your neural network or a reinforcement learning model, you may want to use your previous learning to uh, go ahead with the uh, further subsequent processing. So it's important not only the distribution of data across the different nodes, but also how these worker nodes can communicate with each other and can use the data that has been processed um, by one of the worker node to be used by another worker node because there is a, a strong interlinkages that is dependent across the worker nodes. I would definitely recommend to check out uh, the project hydrogen um, processings on the Sparks website. Now let's move ahead um, and focus on the Spark terminologies uh, which we encountered earlier. So the main uh, pro terminology which you may encounter in using the Spark is RDDs because RDD forms the base of uh, all the Spark data processing. So RDDs are the main abstraction of the Spark and it's a resilient distributed data set which, which is a collection of element that has been partitioned across the nodes. So all the data that you read within the Spark is ultimately processed in the form of RDDs and these RDDs are uh, created uh, when you read the file and put that into the Spark uh, data, uh, Spark data sets. And so RDDs, you can think in terms of uh, Java objects, which are uh, being processed within the JVM environment. So it's the lowest level of abstraction that is um, provided by Spark and all the processing ultimately happens in the form of RDDs. But having a RDD manipulation using the different objects is uh, really difficult because you have to understand about not only um, the tuning of the Java objects within the JVM area, but also you will have to focus on the native uh, or the customized uh, Java based. You need to know basically about the Java processing. So this part came up with the data frames, which is a higher level abstraction after 1.6. Is It is in line with that we wanted to simplify uh, not only the data processing uh, capabilities, but also we want to do it at ease. So Spark uh, provides uh, different data frames available in Scala, Java, Python, and R. So it's pretty much similar to you uh, the data frames that you encounter in Pandas. So similarly, 
you, you can use the data frames of Java and or R. It and also it includes uh, some kind of um, uh, optimization engine uh, techniques. So when the data, when you interact with the data frames, it your underlying uh, data execution is inher inherently gets optimized. So it's always advisable to use data frames until unless you have a specific use case where you need to interact with RDDs and process the data at the lower abstraction level. Most of 99% of the use cases, um, developers interact with the data frames and it provides an inherent uh, Spark SQL optimized execution. Then you might encounter with the transformations and actions. So transformation is a function which produces a new RDD from an existing RDDs. So there's an important concept uh, about the RDDs. RDDs are immutable. So once you have created an RDD, you cannot um, change it. You Rather, you can create a new RDD uh, using that particular RDD. And these transformations are lazy in nature. When I say lazy in nature, it means um, if you have created an RDD, it is not going to be executed immediately. Rather, it will just create a plan and just store it itself. It will only be executed if uh, when you will call an action or if you want to um, get the results of your RDD creation and project it on, your, on the driver node. So there is an, some advantages of using the lazy execution uh, approach uh, while working with RDDs. The main um, advantage of having a lazy execution is that it provides a resilience to your system. So if, since you are, we are working in an in-memory compute, uh, in-memory processing and during your memory operation, if there is any failure happens, your data gets lost. You can think in terms of your working in uh, the RAM area and the data doesn't process for a very long time. So you need to know how this RDD was created and then it provides a kind of a resilience. So whenever uh, there is any loss happens, it just recompute itself and creates the RDDs. And what are the actions? So in the transformations, we saw that one RDD gets creates another RDD, but when you want to work with actual data set at this particular point, an action is performed. And the actions are the Spark RDD operations that gives the non-RDD values. So for example, you, if you are counting the data or if you want doing some kind of an aggregation and you want to project that, during at that particular point, all the data from the driver nodes gets uh, executed and then it's returned back to the client application. So this uh, is known as um, actions in terms of Spark. So, we you might also encounter in the jobs stages and tasks this might become sometimes very confusing what the jobs and the stages and tasks are um, jobs are uh, whenever you perform any action uh, the spark job is created so jobs is nothing but uh, the kind of um, the package of work that is submitted to the spark and these uh, jobs are created at the driver node by the driver nodes and then each work uh, within the job is then broken down into multiple stages. So how do we def uh, decide uh, how many stages we should have within a particular job? It is based on the shuffle boundary. So if your data needs shuffling across um, the different nodes, then all that uh, data, all that work is tagged into the single stage. So within the jobs, you can have multiple stages on the basis of the shuffle boundaries. And then within each stage, you can have uh, some tasks that are uh, relevant to a particular uh, processing um, area. So we can consider this task as a smallest unit of work for a Spark and a single um, a task, a single operation that is applied to a single partition or uh, the single uh, area of data. Uh, we have a very um, small diagram here. We can see that we at the driver node, we have got multiple uh, jobs that has been submitted to the driver node. Each job may consist of multiple or single stage. And within this stage, we can have single or multiple tasks that are available. And uh, here at the bottom right, you can see like we have a driver program, which is interacting with the cluster manager using the Spark context. And the cluster manager assigns the resources or the worker nodes, the driver program uh, for the actual work processing. 
And within the worker node, we can see like we have a set of executors or the processes that are available for the actual work. And for each executor is associated with a cache memory, which is capable of handling some of the tasks. So, and each worker node performs the work that has been assigned by the driver node and sends us its result back to the driver node. So this is a kind of summary of entire uh, Spark internal processing that happens uh, when we submit any of the Spark job to the driver program. Let's move on. So until now we saw that how uh, the Spark um, processing happens. Let's try to think around and uh, understand how can we improve the performance of our uh, jobs. You might think around, um, okay, so if uh, there is a parallel processing that is happening across the multiple uh, more nodes, why we should not um, have any kind of interdependencies across the different uh, worker nodes. So which means you would like to reduce your expensive shuffle operations. For example, worker node one is doing some work which is required by worker two to begin with. In this manner, uh, you will not be able to achieve your parallelism or this is in terms of uh, in terminologies of Spark, we may want to reduce a shuffling of data or data redistribution every time. We cannot always avoid that. Uh, if we have these dependencies, uh, for example, if you are using operations like group by key or reduce by operations or joining across the two data sets where the data lies on the different nodes, then you might you will have to do that but in some certain areas you may want to uh, avoid that and this is something which can be configured within the spark uh, using the shuffle partitions configurations so we need to optimally uh, tune our property of shuffle partitions to improve its performance um, another thing you may want to think around why to read the data from the hard disk every time why not cache it if we have a data frame uh, you can see here we have a data frame. Why, why to read the data from uh, raw data again and again every time to create the same copy of the data? Yes, you're right. We can uh, uh, read the data once. We create our base data frame, and then we can just use put that data frame into the cache memory of the executors that we saw earlier. So every time we will need uh, the copy of this raw data frame, we'll just um, go ahead and read the cache memory um, read it from the cache memory, which is always um, faster. So Spark provides the multiple storage levels. Um, so for example, either you can read the data from memory only or memory and disk, uh, if the data cannot fit into the certain memory area. And then we it, at the same time, we have six, um, uh, seven uh, storage levels you can see here, uh, which can be used uh, for the Spark performance tuning. Let's uh, look at the next um, tuning aspect, which you can use the serialized data format. And this is a very common um, while working with the Spark uh, data processing. Uh, we should always read the data in a kind of um, serialized data format. So when I say serialized data format, it means uh, in the data format, which is readily usable for the next pipeline stage. So consider the data pipelines in such a manner that you are uh, processing some, some data which is going to be used by another uh, part of your pipeline. So if uh, you are persisting your data in, in such a manner that it is readily available and there is no operation involved of serialization and deserialization, um, you will fasten up your uh, Spark processing and it will improve your um, processing capabilities. So for example, you may want to go ahead with the optimized version of data processing uh, frame formats for uh, having uh, a packet is a common uh, uh, method of serializing the data and Avro is another. So it always depends upon the use case, which format to go with, but most likely if you implement um, serialized data format, then it will uh, improve your processing of data. And then we have, we don't want to log out, log everything that is happening within this uh, Spark processing. So you can disable your debug and information logging. Uh, and just log out whenever there is any warning happens. And it uh, does save lots of um, resources because every time you enable your debug and for logging, uh, it goes and saves into your hard disk or uh, storage, which is an extra cost for the system. So again, IO operations is something which we can optimize at this point. 
you may also want to use the proper partitioning strategy. So for example, using repartition or coalescing. Uh, so in the repartitioning, uh, there's a shuffle, op shuffle operation that happens. So at the top right, you can see here, we have uh, four data sets, um, which are partitioned on the different um, uh, values. And if you want to reduce the number of partitions, always go ahead with the coalesce uh, operation because in the coalesce operation, we are going to have uh, the union of uh, the data sets. Rather than uh, if you go with the repartitioning, then everything is going to uh, have a data reshuffle. And after the reshuffling, then the partitioning is going to happen. So you may want to avoid the unnecessary full cluster scan. So another important thing, which is uh, I briefly touched upon earlier as well, is to always go with the higher abstraction levels of implementing your Spark data processing. So for example, you use data frames or data sets instead of uh, doing uh, your data processing using RDDs and because RDDs um, uh, are not that optimized as compared with the data frames and the data set. And also if you are reading data from some of the database, which is very common uh, in terms of this path processing, you may want to use your push down optimizations to extract the capabilities of your underlying uh, databases. So for example, if you're using tire data, you may want to use some of the capabilities which each database offers. At the same time, you may also want to use the partitioning and the fetch size um, uh, uh, hyperparameters, which you can tune out to improve your performance of your reads and writes uh, from this part. This is another important point. You, uh, you should avoid the user-defined functions because user-defined functions is something which causes um, uh, data serialization and the deserializations uh, every time. So every time you use any kind of a uh, user-defined function, it's really expensive and the real cost lies in the serialization and the deserialization. So it's always better to go with uh, Spark uh, provided functions uh, to improve the data processing. Then we have a join strategies, which is another important point uh, you might need, want to think around. So if you have two big tables and joining together, then there's a shuffle join that is bound to happen, but you can tweak out your parameters up to which particular point the shuffle join should happen. Uh, if there's a big to a small table join, then the broadcast join allows you to copy the small tables over uh, each uh, worker node, and then it will prevent your unnecessary data shufflings and will improve your performance. So let's have some quick uh, exercises on the big data uh, processing using Colab. I have got uh, some data which has been downloaded uh, from Kaggle and uh, we are going to uh, download some data from Kaggle and then we will do a quick uh, demonstration on the data processing using Kaggle. So here I'm just installing um, Kaggle API uh, and then after that, we are going to have, uh, in order to uh, download the data from Kaggle, you will need a kind of an authentication or a credential file every time. Uh, so I have already downloaded this uh, into my system. So let's pick that. So I have the Kaggle. So it's a credential file, which will be unique um, for your system. And you may want to just write that. So here we will create a Kaggle directory into our system. And then uh, I just change the permission, but since I've already created, it will not allow me to do that, but that's okay. Here we are going to download the data from Kaggle, uh, which is a daily temperature data sets of all the major cities and countries. And it's uh, available as an open source uh, and free to use. You may want to just go ahead. So since I had already uh, downloaded, uh, it and I unzipped this into my uh, workspace here. So you can see I have a temperature, city temperature CSV, which I have got here. And in order to work with um, Spark, we need um, JDK that is supposed, and that is a need to be available in our environment. And then we have the, we need to have the PySpark that is available. It's very simple to install. It's just a Python package, PySpark, you can, uh, install and mentioning the version. So I'm using here the 3.2.1, which is a stable version of 
PySpark. And in order to check if I have installed it correctly, I can run this uh, PySpark version to identify how it's, uh, what the version and is, if it has been installed successfully. Here, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Python is, has provided us the Spark session as a gateway to interact with um, the cluster manager. So I'm using the Spark session uh, here currently instead of a Spark context. That's another thing to watch out. And here we are just reading the data from uh, the city temperature CSV data file that I have just downloaded from Kaggle. Let's try to in inspect the schema using the print schema function. We can see that it contains region information, country, state, and uh, the average temperature until now for each month. And here, if we try to run, uh, see the five uh, top five rows of our file, we can see that the format is a row format. So now since we are interacting with the data frame, which is a higher level abstraction, so it um, stores the data in the form of a row, uh, Java row data object format. And if we use the show function, then we can see that we have got uh, some the top five rows of this particular data set. And if we uh, want to use the PySpark here, uh, that means we want to perform the data processing using Python. Uh, so I'm using the PySpark uh, library here and the SQL types of integer and the float type. You can see here uh, that this particular average temperature is a string and I cannot uh, perform any kind of an averaging operation or a function on the numeric column on this string type column. So I will have, be converting here to the float type, which I just did. And then let's see how it looks like. So we can see here it's an converted into a float type column. So during, but here we can see that it's kind of, a, a, the temperature is given in the Fahrenheit and uh, we need to convert the data into Celsius scale. So just use that um, simple logic and formula to convert it into uh, Celsius scale and see, we can see here it, like the average temperature converted is now in Celsius, degree Celsius and here, if we want to, let's say, um, explore this data using the Python API or Py, uh, Python API, as I said uh, earlier, it's a unified engine. Uh, you can use any of the language to interact with. Uh, let's say I'm proficient in Python. I want to use Python. So I can simply interact with my uh, data frame, PySpark data frame using Python by applying um, the filter for all the region, for all the countries within the Asia region. And then I'm grouping here on the basis of countries and year. And I want to find the aggregated um, average temperature for all the countries uh, within Asia region. And here it's an important point. Now here we have got um, the average temperature for each country for each year from the Asia region, but I also want to understand how it has been calculated internally. So here we have a dot explain function, which you can use in Spark to come up uh, with an execution plan that it uses underlying. So we can see here it initially performs the file scans, then we filter out the temperatures um, where the uh, and casted the temperature as float, and uh, then we also put the filter uh, on the region as Asia. And after that, it projects the result set uh, containing these columns only. Um, and then we perform an aggregation on, on the basis of partial, uh, on the on the basis at the level of country and year and the, and the functions. Uh, so it has a partial average function. So you don't uh, have to calculate the actual exact average of your temperature rather we can focus on um, having the quick partial averages that is available and it's approximately the same uh, of your average function. And then there is a hash partitioning exchange operation that happens. After this, we can see here, then the final aggregation happens. And here we apply the average um, temperature conversion uh, that is ultimately being, uh, because this is the data data um, set that has been resulted and re returned to the driver node from each of our nodes. And once the computation happens at the driver node, we can see here then the X after the range partitioning, 
It uh, also performs a sorting operation because we uh, have mentioned it to be ordered by, to be country at year, country and year. So it performs the sorting operation here and then its results uh, sends you the final results. So it's important to understand how it is processing internally uh, when we process this uh, data. But until now, uh, let's say I'm not proficient with Python and I'm comfortable with SQL. So as I said earlier, uh, Spark also provides the uh, capabilities to interact with your, with your data using SQL. So you may want to just, you can just persist it in a kind of a view. Uh, and then we can give uh, the new name for this view as temperature. And uh, we can interact and play around with the data using the uh, Spark SQL uh, API. So for example, here you can see like I interacted with, um, with, the, uh, with the data using the simple SQL query where I aggregated the countries uh, and the year level and calculated the average temperature uh, in degrees Celsius for Asian region. But uh, we also need to think around, uh, do we have the same explained plan or uh, the process, does the internal processing happens in a similar manner? We can compare here the execution plan for this and it came out to be exactly same how we got it from the Python based processing. So we have the exact same steps of file scanning, filtering, projection, and then the exchanging of uh, partitions and after that sorting operations. So here we can use the same uh, Spark SQL um, to, uh, to come, come uh, to do have any kind of a queries. After that, we uh, may also want to think around what uh, does uh, the Spark allows to have the complex SQL queries because you might be using CTs, subqueries. It does allows that and it's just that the explain plan um, becomes a little bit uh, complex uh, depending upon the query that you may you are executing. So for example, here, let's say I want to identify for all the Asian countries uh, uh, and want to perform an aggregation of year and countries and a corresponding average temperature whose average temperature is higher than the global temperature. So if you are well versed with the CT, you can figure out, I'm finding it here, uh, an average global temperature and then picking all the countries whose uh, average temperature is higher than the global average temperature and then sorting the order, uh, sorting the results on, on the basis of the average temperature. And if I run this query, then we can see that um, the top countries and the year uh, that they had the highest temperature until now. So we can see it's Thailand uh, and Indonesia. They are the countries which had a higher temperature until now. You can use uh, the describe operations like we generally do in databases to figure the schema of the objects or the view that we have created. And now let's, we can also uh, explore some of uh, the internal processing, um, though we don't have lots of time left, but let's quickly go through that. In order to interact with your Spark uh, UI, you will need um, the Find Spark uh, application or package that is provided for the inter uh, interaction. So here uh, I'm importing the PySpark uh, package. And after that, uh, you have to download and install ng-rock. This is the step that you will have to do if you are interacting uh, within the Google Colab. But if you are, have set it up on your local system, then you won't have to do this step. So once I perform this uh, operation, and I will be in the end, I will be getting a public URL for my Spark UI. So if I go back, uh, if I click on that um, uh, Spark UI URL, once again, let's try to see. Okay, so here. So here you can see uh, all the Spark jobs that has been executed until now. We can see there were 28 jobs that has been executed within the shell. And uh, if we just pick uh, the first job, which was a very simple job just to read 
the data from the CSV and put that into Python data frame, it, we can see uh, the stage or the different steps in which that were involved in the stage execution. We can see here we had a file scanning operations and then the map partitioning operations uh, that would happen. So what we did, we did read the file, we partitioned it across the different uh, worker nodes. And uh, this is uh, the stage that was responsible for this operation. We have some of the matrices which are available for each uh, uh, particular stages and at the executor level information. Uh, though uh, we are running out of time, we can quickly look at the different uh, options that we have uh, in the Spark UI. You can see here, we have uh, multiple memory level tweaks uh, that you can see here that has been done. And at the same time, we can also get executor levels informations that has uh, been used. So that's a quick one um, to explore uh, on Spark UI. Uh, let's go back to our presentation. Sure. Okay, so after this exercise, uh, I would just want to leave you with the one single thought that Spark is a processing engine and doesn't uh, contains a coupling of uh, permanent storage and the compute like we have other resources that are available till now and all, all, all of your code executes on the JVM. So whether you use Python or R, you will uh, be having using internally the JVM to process your data. And it will be a Spark session that is going to be created as a gateway to have a communication with the executors. Uh, I, all the diagrams which I used were not mine. So I am thankful to the various people who created uh, those diagrams and I refer to these um, different uh, resources for the preparation of my slides. Yeah, thank you. So that's all we have. We can uh, take some questions if there are. Before we proceed to answer your question, uh, I would like to request the attendees to please fill in the poll about feedback as it helps us to conduct more such sessions. Yeah, yes, sir, you can take a QA now. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the first question is the fundamentals and then the framework. So I did cover it, some of the fundamentals, um, but it was important uh, to give you an overview of the framework and the first um, stage. So I believe um, by now you might have a good understanding of the fundamentals as well as the framework. Uh, let's move on the second uh, question. What do you mean by ecosystem? So when I say ecosystem, uh, ecosystem contains all the different components. It doesn't mean only how the processing is happening. Uh, we also focuses on the different um, parts of uh, the entire uh, area. Like for example, if you are using your cluster, how are you going to manage your cluster? If you are using your processing, then we have a Spark core, which is responsible for processing. If you are uh, interacting with uh, Spark in a particular language, then we need to have an API uh, to interact with that language. So all this uh, constitutes an Spark ecosystem. Why Beam was introduced? So Beam was introduced as part of uh, the different requirements that we had uh, earlier. So for example, you may want it to have stateful computations. We may want to have the streaming data at the same time batch data processing at the same time you might need the etl processing to be embedded for those use cases and scenarios so spark beam is actually um the kind of uh, new technology that has taken care of lots of different areas as we are evolved across the data pipeline evolution journey is the is Apache Beam provides the same functionality as uh, Apache Spark? Yes, it does. Uh, since uh, you can use um, the streaming capabilities as well as um, batch processing, at the same time, you can use uh, ETL uh, processing. So it does provide the same kind of functionality, but you have 
uh, it is aimed to serve for the different purposes because you may want to uh, focus on the batch processing the streaming process within the same uh, area rather than having the Spark streaming or the Spark core, uh, every different altogether. So in, to, in short, yes, it does provide uh, the same functionality as the Spark. Uh, what is the difference between partition and parallelism? So when I say partition, it means uh, your data is going to be uh, divided and will be put into the different chunks, into different uh, parts of the worker nodes. But when I say parallelism, so parallelism is uh, usually focused on how your processing that is going to happen internally. So the another concepts of parallelism is uh, that you may want to distribute your workload across uh, the different parts of your cluster uh, uniformly. So that's where the concepts of parallelism comes into the picture and partition is one of the way uh, to achieve that parallelism. Okay, uh, let's pick the next one, how to upload data set from desktop to Colab. You can use, um, to, from if you are uh, interacting with Colab, then uh, you can directly upload it within the runtime environment. Uh, so just, click on upload button at the top. And uh, it's very easy to upload your data set from desktop to Colab. But if you are uh, have some kind of a data if, which you want to read in the form of API, so PySpark does allow that. Okay, so let's pick the next one. When we use Lambda function UDF, that time is also use serialization. Uh, yes, so all the UDF um, does involve some kind of uh, data serialization. So for example, the reason is that uh, data serialization involves the decoding and coding of data, which causes um, the issues when you want to process your data in, within the Spark environment, because first of all, you need to serialize the data into the Spark RDD format, and then it gets deserialized uh, when you write the data into the back to the Python uh, data frame. Okay, uh, next one, please share the notebook. I will share that uh, with the analytics with you and then um, it can be published on that. Can two workers run on the same server? Yes, uh, you can have uh, multiple workers running on the same server. Um, the reason is uh, even you're working on the standalone um, app mode, then you might have four threads or five threads or eight threads running on the same server. Uh, so here uh, the parallelism comes on the, uh, the level of threads rather than on the, work, uh, the level of nodes. So yes, to answer your question, we can have two worker nodes, two workers running on the same server, but that execution will happen through the threads. Taking the next one, is it possible to include um, Sean of the year, uh, summer, winter together with country temperature? Yes, you can perform um, uh, grouping at any of the level. So it is it is very much it's simple, uh, as simple like the level of aggregation that you want to do. So it is indeed possible. Let's pick the next one. Uh, okay, that's the season of the year, swine. If we know Hadoop, Spark, Flume, can we learn machine learning and how it will be useful with the Spark? Uh, Hadoop is not a single um, technology. It's a kind of a framework. Within Hadoop ecosystems, you have the different uh, parts like I touched upon. You may want to focus on uh, Spark, which is focusing only on how the data processing happens, but there are certain other elements uh, as well. So for example, the cluster management is one of the area which you might want to uh, look at, or you may want to look at the streaming part of the technology. And in terms of machine learning, machine learning is a very wide area. So there is no straight uh, way. Uh, it's a very evolving and uh, diverse area. Uh, regarding its utility with the Spark, uh, since Spark provides a single unified framework for your machine learning applications, so it is indeed very uh, much uh, useful to learn Spark because you can then interact with uh, your data science models creations, your deep learning models creations. So it is very much um, helpful. 
what about uh, chat gpt for big data yes so it's a very good question so chat gpt uh, with big data uh, chat gpt focuses more on the natural language processing where um, it performs the data modeling uh, uh, using the natural language processing models but uh, as i mentioned project hydrogen it is focusing more on understanding uh, how we can have the interaction and communication across the nodes which is very crucial for the natural language processing and chat gpt uh, is something which is in the very early stage and we are not sure how it's going to evolve and uh, spark is going to integrate its functionality okay do we have more uh, i believe uh, we have taken up all the questions thanks a lot akshay uh, on behalf of analytic vidya uh, I would like to thank you for your time and uh, for delivering such a wonderful session. I'm sure our audience found it insightful and uh, hopefully we can conduct more sessions with you in future. I hope sure. you guys have filled in the feedback poll. Uh, if not, uh, I request you to please fill in the poll about feedback as it helps us to conduct more such sessions. If you wish to conduct a webinar or facing any difficulty in registering, uh, connect with us at editor at the rate analyticvidya.com. The recording of the session will be available within two days on our YouTube channel and the link is given in the chat section. We will be back with another session of the data hour. Uh, the link is in the chat section. Uh, till then, uh, bye bye and keep learning.